Emily Thornbury, I'm really looking forward to this one. Um, this series is all about getting to know the person behind the caricature of, of politicians and um, get to know the real person, really. And it struck me when I was thinking about interviewing you that actually I think you are one of the most caricatured politicians. I think people make judgments about you, um, which will explore why they, they might do that. And I, and I guess if I was to do a shorthand for that judgment mm -hmm. that they make about you, it's sort of islington -y, North London, metropolitan elite. Mm -hmm. Is that fair? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it's fair. I mean, I think that's the thing about caricatures, isn't it? Is that they quite often have a sort of germ of truth. I live in North London. I'm from Islington. I'm a barrister. I'm married to a really successful barrister who's become a judge, a high court judge. He was knighted. He's now in the Court of Appeal. I'm very proud of him. Um, and we've done well, you know, and I talk like this. <laughs> but there's kind of another side to people. I mean, as with caricatures, there is some germ of truth, but quite often they they paper over the real truth. So just like people say about Islington, you know, they say that it, they think about like Georgian squares and cappuccino bars and all of this, right? Um, and that's absolutely true. But also we've got the worst mental health statistics in the country. We've got, I think, the fourth or fifth worst child poverty statistics in the country. The reason that people vote Labour in my constituency very often is because they really need to have a Labour government that will give them a chance. And, and so if you go around the estates in my constituency, you know, they're, they're well painted, the lifts work, but if you go into people's flats, you see real poverty. And, and that is a hidden side to Islington that people don't realise. You know, nearly half of the children in my primary schools are on free school dinners. You know, so therefore their parents are on benefits. It's a very different picture. And the same with me. So I've done well. Um, but, you know, my parents split up when I was seven. Um, we were chucked out. The bailiffs turned up. I remember they were wearing bowler hats. Um, we were homeless. A Labour councillor helped my mum get a council house. And for that reason, we were able to stay together and helped her get onto benefits and all of that stuff. So I was on free school dinners, like half the kids in my primary schools. Um, we had uh, bags of clothes given to us and boxes of food. You know, we used to have this running joke about Campbell's meat meatballs, because one of the ladies used to give us food, but always give us Camb Campbell's meatballs, and it didn't matter. We just hated them, and Mum used to keep them under the stairs. And if we wouldn't eat the food, she'd say, you'll have to have the Campbell's meatballs if you don't. You know, so we were really poor. You know, we lived on, you know, say, second-hand clothes and, and food parcels and all of that, free school dinners. And my main meal of the day was, was school lunch. Um, I failed the 11 plus. I went to a school where my, where my, uh, the guy in charge of careers, when I asked him what he thought I would do with myself, he said, well, you can always visit people in prison, which I did because I became a criminal barrister. And I kind of wish that he could see me now. Because <laughs> I think the thing about, you know, the, the school that I was at was a school that sort of served the council estate that I was brought up on. And there was this feeling of know your place. This is where you are. This is what's what. You know, don't, you know, just don't make ructions. You know, everybody has their place in life and this is yours. And, um, yeah, so that's so it's a very mixed background, you know, so it's a mixed background. And then I had this kind of thing where my parents um, had had met at university and um, and we'd sort of, you know, they'd moved to Guildford where my mum would stop work and, you know, had three little kids. And my dad was a university lecturer at the LSE where he taught a whole lot of people. I mean, I meet lawyers um, sort of 10 years older than me and they're always saying, did your father teach me? You know, so he was at the LSE and, um, and then they split up and, and dad disappeared. And he eventually went to work for the United Nations and he would just sort of, he was this kind of incredibly glamorous figure that sort of flitted backwards and forwards. He would like turn up, you know, unannounced with gifts from India. I don't know what he'd been doing in India, yeah, but he'd been in India and, um, when I was on my 15th birthday, um, Dad invited us to go to Africa. I'd been on a day trip to France. I hadn't been abroad. And we went to Africa for two weeks. We went to Zambia and Malawi. Completely blows your mind. 
um, and then came back again. So there was this kind of odd mixture. And um, when we saw Dad, he would go, well, "What are you doing with yourself? You know, what, 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 what Ola in those days? Ola's. What Ola was he doing? What do you expect to do with your life?" You know, and I've got my careers teacher on the one hand telling me that I can visit people in prison. And then I've got, you know, my dad saying, well, what are you going to do with your life? And my poor mum just trying to kind of hold things together. So it was a very mixed background, you know. How often did you see your dad? So this uh, divorced at seven. Yeah. And he came. Uh... Well, so first of all, he disappeared for quite a long time. And when he disappeared for quite a long time, it was when we got chucked out of the house because there was like no money coming in at all. So that's when we couldn't pay the mortgage and all that stuff. So that's that's when that happened. And then and then he turned up again. I think he lived in Norway for quite a long time. I mean, honestly, I don't know. And then and then when I was about to turn 16, I had a massive row with my mum. I'd had many rows with my mum before then, but this was the massive row. And so she chucked me out. So I went to live with my dad in London and he was living at that point in Hammersmith. So I lived with him and then when I was 17, I went to, univers I went to school um, up in Shepherd's Bush and, um, and, and when I was 17, Dad went to New York for the weekend and he didn't come back <laughs> because he'd got a job with the United Nations. And so he, and because of he had this expertise in Namibia, Southwest Africa, and Namibia was about to go independent and Dad had really good connections with SWAPO, which was the organisation that in the end took over Namibia, um, you know, and so on. So that's why he was there. And he was there as a sort of political advisor to the United Nations um, who were trying to kind of set up. And actually, actually, uh, Namibia is one of the great success stories of the United Nations. Nobody knows about it because it, it worked. Anyway, he did that. He did, and then he did peacekeeping all over the world, you know? What's quite interesting, when you speak about your dad, yeah. you speak about his achievements, yeah, 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 and yeah. you go and you move off the relationship that you yeah. had with him yeah, to yeah. speak about yeah, his yeah, achievements. Yeah. Was he a good dad? He was a terrible father. He was the most terrible father, but he was a great man. So it was this mixture, you know. So he was very, he was Irish, he was very charming. Um, he was a kind of like, you know, he was an Irish rover. I mean, he was like, you know, He'd light up a room. He was, as I say, very charismatic. He was very internationalist to his, to his bones. He was, you know, very much of the left. He was, he was a great lover of people, particularly a lover of women. He married many, many times and had loads of girlfriends. But he was a terrible father, because a father, you need to have consistency, you know, affection, you need to have some stability. He didn't have any of that. I mean, he was like the original kind of helicopter parent, like almost kind of like almost arriving in a helicopter, you know, for a few hours and then disappearing in. We'd go and see him and he'd pick you up from the airport and he'd drive you in. We all used to laugh about this. When he picked you up from the airport and drove you into wherever he was living, he would then go, well, what are you doing with yourself? You know, sort yourself out, you know, da 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 and kind of give you a lecture on, you know, how you were ruining your life. And you'd arrive at his house and then he wouldn't speak to you again. So it was like, it was very odd, you know, it was very odd. Um, but I think he was probably better with me than he was with anybody else, because I was the oldest. So I was the oldest out of six. So my dad married, as I say, lots of times. How did that affect you? How old were you when he married, first married again, or when he, you were aware that he had a, a girlfriend? Well, I, the her. first I was aware was when, um, when I was seven, because the, because the splitting up of the marriage was pretty kind of like, yeah, it was a bit of a thing. And, um, and he had a child, and the child looked just like him, and the child lived in the town. And My goodness. All of that. So and you're, all you're of aware that. of this at, at the yeah, age of seven? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know about that. So, you know about that. Um, so yeah, so, so I didn't get on particularly well with, with my first stepmother, although actually she was a really remarkable woman. And there are times when I realise I've learned so much from her. In fact, I met a variety of different women through my father and through my father's various marriages that I would never have anything to do with. You know, I, I learned, learned about and their different perspectives on life and so on. Um, but, you know, I also felt kind of quite sad for my dad, who was just like a great romantic. And every time, you know, he'd fall in love again and this was the time and this was going to be happiness and this time it would work. And it never did, you know, and then, you know, and. and and he never managed to, f to, to keep any long-term bonds with anybody, really. I mean, he did with me, because I was his oldest child. But, you know, Peter, his son who lived in Norway, wouldn't speak to him. My brothers wouldn't speak to him. You know, I've got two half-sisters in France who just like, 
work. Really? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's really sad, actually. But you, are you, know? you in touch with, with his children? Yeah. So, particularly my one of my sisters in France, who I get on with really well, and we're really similar. And, uh, and she's a great girl. <laughs> she's just something else. You know, she's unstoppable force. She's like, nothing phases her. And she's had a pretty difficult time, but she's something, you know? Um, Peter, not so much. Um, and, you know, the different, different but, but, but Kate in France is uh, something, yeah. Is your dad still with us? No, no. So that was the other sad thing, really, was that he, so he'd been in he'd been in Bosnia. He'd been peacekeeping in Bosnia, um, and uh, and I mean I would learn, you know, like he'd been he'd been held hostage in Mostar through the front page of the Observer, you know, and I just like what the hell is going on? Or he'd been shot at, and there was like news reports Cedric Thornbury's been shot at, and and I didn't know you know any of this stuff. But he was really brave. I mean he was a brave man as well. I think that's the other thing to say, you know, charismatic, great sense of energy bravery, huge bravery, um, but I never complained. And then, and then he was back in Bosnia or in, in and, um, and met someone there. And he was like on this little island off the coast of Croatia, miles and miles and miles away from anywhere. And uh, at the tender mercies of this particular woman and uh, started to get dementia. When was this? When was, so this was... So, yeah, so it was really, you know, for somebody who'd like, Burnt all your bridges, do you know what I mean? After the pursuit of love, you know, this is the one. And she definitely wasn't the one. She definitely wasn't the one. And, um, and I remember saying to him, I'm really worried about your dad. You know, I think we need to make some long-term plans. And she looked me in the eyes and said, I will always look after him. Well, a year later, he arrives in Heathrow in a wheelchair saying, I have dementia, Emily, look after me. You know, and his bank account has largely been emptied and all of this. You know, so this is what happens. And nobody wanted to have anything to do with him. But he was my dad. And my brother Jim, who's like a really good soul, actually, I mean, I had a general election coming up. I had, you know, all sorts of stuff going on with my family, you know, A-levels and O-levels, GCSEs and Lord knows what going on with my family. So I was really, really busy. So Jim found an old people's home for him to move into. And, and then I did the visiting. So I would go and see him. And actually, over the next few years, he had this thing called Lewy body's dementia, which is a type of Parkinson's. Normally people get Parkinson's and then they get Lewy bodies. And Lewy bodies is horrible. All dementia is horrible, but this is a really horrible form of dementia. You get these visions, and he would get visions about children, which is ironic, and, and children in need, and children desperate. And he would get really upset. And he would say, the children, the children, which is quite hard. Um, and there was nothing that could be done about it. You couldn't give any of the anti-dementia drugs that you can give to people who have other types of dementia. So he had to live with all of this. And, and it came in waves. And he would say to me, it's a bit like being in the sea, Emily. Sometimes I'm swimming, and then sometimes I'm drowning. And I'd make sure that I saw him in the morning because he was more compass mentis in the morning and by the afternoon he was sort of losing it. And I started off really, really resenting this, you know, because he'd left me when I was seven. He'd left me when I was 17. There were children all over the world, quite frankly, whose, you know, whose, whose, whose belief in themselves was not what it should be, quite often, because of the behaviour of their dad. Because and he had been completely irresponsible and totally selfish but I still loved him, and he was there by himself. And, and I think, and I forgave him. And it, for me, it came like a, a blessing, you know? Because there's an awful lot of energy used up in anger, yeah? Or, I mean, like, that's who he was. And actually, I learned so much from having a dad like that. A lot of negative stuff, but actually, I'm, I am who I am. You know, and I'm a mixture of my mum and I'm a mixture of my dad and I'm a mixture of my experiences from my childhood. And it's all right. And when he died, I was, I was there during the day before he died. And as I said, he was Irish and, 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 I, and he was lying on his bed and I was stroking his hair and I was singing these Irish songs to him. <laughs> and then he went to sleep and then I went home. And then I got a call saying that he'd died. 
but he died in the way that he would ever want to die. He was in bed. He was a great favourite in the home. He used to think that he was back in the United Nations because everybody working in the home came from all over the world, right? So he used to think <laughs> you know, that this was the Philippines representative. <laughs> you know, it was very funny. Anyway, um, and he was in this bed and there were women from, there were seven women, I was told, sitting around his bed from all over the world, weeping as he died. That was the way he'd want to go. I mean, you know, and, and I was sad. I was sad when he went, and, and the funeral, I, you know, I cried. My siblings turned up still raging. That was what was so interesting, you know? So I feel as though I kind of came full circle, I found a place, it was all right, you know? But my siblings still didn't, haven't really got over it. Do you think it affected your ability to form relationships or your, your, your relationships with men when the most significant mm. man in your life mm. let you down in so many ways? Well, I was really lucky, actually, um, because at the age of 22, you see, at the age of 22, I met my husband. Ah. In fact, my parents had met when they were 22. So I met Chris at 22 and I thought, well, he's not obviously going to leave me. Um, so we'd, there's no point, you know, and it actually took him about eight years for him to persuade me that he wasn't going to leave. So we got married when I was 30 and we had a first child when I was 31. And it was like, I just needed that amount of time. And he just sort of stuck, stuck it out, stuck it out, you know, and always believed me, always, 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 always believed me, always, always believed in me and uh, always loved me. And I needed it. And I wouldn't be who I am without him, without a doubt. Not with that sort of dad. You're right. There'll be people who have, lots of people who are watching, who have difficult relationships with their parents, yeah, yeah, yeah. are angry with their parents, mm. perhaps don't speak to their parents. Mm. You've obviously found it in yourself to forgive mm. the failings of your father as a father. Mm. What, do you have any advice for how people might come to terms with imperfect parents? I, I couldn't possibly look into other families and, and give advice. I mean, all I can say is from my own experience, which was that, was that the forgiveness was a gift to me. It just made, made, my, it's made my life much easier. And I look at my siblings and realize their lives are more difficult because they weren't able to, for whatever reason, forgive. And I think that's, when I look at them, I think it's a shame. Because what do you ever prove? You know, I mean, like, you know, that's, you know they are who they are. So, when I first met you in the House of Commons, mm -hmm. and I think this will, um, will surprise, it surprised me actually. Oh. So it was like, you, I, I think I was having a cigarette. Yeah. And we, we, we were smoking we, yeah, we, <laughs> we were smoking <laughs> But I don't know, I don't know what like preconceptions I have as who <laughs> smokes fags or not. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I didn't expect you to, to smoke cigarettes. Do you, do you still smoke? I've just given up. I gave up during the pandemic after like a very, very long time. I don't quite know why I gave up, but I think maybe it was just a, like a change of, of the way of life. Maybe it was also hearing that people who smoked did worse out of COVID. Um, you know, smoking and being the weight I am, probably not a good idea, you know, if you get COVID. But I think it was also just changing the way I did things, going out for walks, just being a bit healthier not going to pubs, not, not being in social situations, maybe it was easier to give up smoking. But I do seem to have. You've nailed it. I mean, I really do ha seem to have. After how many years, roughly? Oh, since I was 18. Yeah, a long time. Just like, I won't go into details, but it's been a long time. <laughs> and you think you've... So really do, yeah. yeah. I really you do. Can, I really do don't it. seem to... There are times when something kind of horrible has happened or, you know, or I've been kind of like quite... And then, I, I you know, you're coming down afterwards, you think, now is the time to have a cigarette, but I don't want one. Wow. I know. You're a lucky I mean, quitter. really, it really <laughs> does seem to have happened to me. <laughs> um, now, sort of to go back to that initial question about why people have, some people have the views about you that they do. Yeah. In 2014, you resigned from the Shadow Cabinet after sending a tweet which was thought to mock a house with an England flag. Yeah. Let's just set the record straight on this. Yeah, just yeah, yeah. What, 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 everybody put, interpreted your motivations mm. from that tweet mm. and interpreted snobbery or whatever mm. it was. What, 
What did you mean by that? So tweet? I mean, it was that we would we were there at the Rochester by election, from what I can remember, and and what I used to do is before the days of you know the other Instagram and so on, but on Twitter I would quite often take photographs in order to give people an insight into a by election. So I think I took a picture of a dog with a rosette and the monster raving loony party and. Some people had made their own posters. Some kids had made some posters saying, vote Felix, and they'd put, kind of done their own drawings. And then I came across this house that was covered in England flags. It didn't just have one. I mean, it had like, just it couldn't, you couldn't see out the windows. So I put that up as well. And I'd put a whole series, and I'd called them images from Rochester or something like that. Um, and so that one went up as well. And then I you know, just went on and carried on knocking on doors and stuff. And I think I went to a parent's evening and then I was on my way back from that and my phone just went crazy with all this kind of like, you know, what's going on and, you know, da, da, da. And, and, um, and, and I was thinking, and, and then I was being told you're going to have to resign. And so and basically I was told, you know, it doesn't really matter what, what you thought. What matters is what people think you thought, you know. And of course, people did interpret it, you know, and pour maybe some of their own feelings into this, which I hadn't, anyway, there we are. You know, so, but in the end, you know, I, I wouldn't want to do anything that would harm the Labour Party. I mean, the Labour Party gave me my house when I was a kid and I was homeless. You know, the Labour Party was a cause, is a cause. My mum was a Labour councillor. You know, I have been Labour all my life. I'm not going to undermine the Labour Party. People tell me that I have done something to harm the Labour Party. I'll do anything to, to, to repair that because I believe in the Labour Party. I believe the only force that can push our country in the right direction is the Labour Party. That's, that's, that's why I'm in politics. So, yeah, so, so there we are. Is that the so hardest thing? Hardest, you, you, the hardest thing you've been through in politics, that particular episode? I think so, because it kind of kept coming back. And also, you know, what was really hard about it was this idea that I was in some way being snobbish. I mean, i have been brought up on a council estate with a house in a house that looked very similar to that. My brother, you know, was a builder. He didn't have a white van, he had a red van. I've got my other brother works for Sainsbury's, drives the trucks for Sainsbury's. I've got a sister who's a bus driver. I mean... What? What? <laughs> it's like, why are people saying this? I mean, yeah, anyway, I mean, that's how it is. That's how it is. And that was kind of hurtful. You know, that was hurtful. The idea that I would sneer at people and people would make assumptions about me with, and not even bother to try to find out who I am. That, I think, kind of. And then you feel as though you're just being, you know, as you said, being used as a caricature, you know, and, and although there is some truth in it, there's a lot of, if you just think that's the only truth, then you don't see the real truth. Well, we found out a lot about you today. <laughs> and um, we've cleared up a lot of those things. And thank you for being so open and sharing with you, the real you. That's with all right. Me. It's been a pleasure.